Well, welcome to this uh, afternoon session on topology and general relativity. Um, last time uh, in our uh, the part on uh, Lorentzian geometry, we discussed the proof of the classical Penrose singularity theorem. And uh, the key ingredient in the proof is the existence of a trapped surface. Um, you have the so-called null expansion scalars, theta plus and theta minus. And a trapped surface requires that both of those are negative. Um, what I wanted to mention, it's up here on, on the slide now, is uh, sometimes uh, in a variant of Penrose singularity theorem, you can get away with a one-sided condition, uh, uh, just having trapping on one side instead of both sides. And this is the, this is the theorem here. which says the following. So we're in a global hyperbolic space-time, null energy condition, both, uh, and we assume we've got a, spa a smooth space-like Cauchy surface V pictured down here. And let sigma be a smooth, closed, compact without boundary hypersurface in V, there's sigma, which separates, which separates V uh, into an inside U and an outside W. Uh, and suppose that W, the outside, including, including sigma, closure of W, is non-compact. So this, this might, you might be compact, but W extends outward non-compact. Then if sigma is outer trapped, that is theta plus is negative with respect to the null normal uh, pointing into this non-compact piece, uh, then the conclusion is as in the Penrose singularity theorem, M is future null geodesically complete. So in this kind, in this setup, you get away with a uh, just a condition uh, on on one side, and uh, I, I'll leave the proof as an exercise. And uh, in in this proof, uh, you want to consider uh, this achronal boundary, and uh, you. Will sh you will argue somewhat similarly to the Penrose singularity theorem that this thing is non-compact, and then you can run an argument that there will be some some uh, inward pointing norm null normal geodesic that's incomplete from sigma. So there's this variation, of this variant of the Penrose singularity theorem, and this variation may, uh, may be used to give a proof of this uh, this beautiful result of of Gannon and proved independently by Lee. And this is the first time that topology really enters the picture. In some sense, this is the beginning of the next section. And it says the following. Let M be a globally hyperbolic space-time, which satisfies the null energy condition. Remember, that's Ricci non-negative on null vectors. And which contains a smooth, asymptotically flat, space-like Cauchy surface V. Then if V is not simply connected. Pi 1 of V is non-trivial. Uh, then M is future null geodesically incomplete. So somehow, non-trivial topology, at least the fundamental group level, is leading to the occurrence of singularities. Um, so, so this suggests that uh, uh, in general relativity, non-trivial topology, uh, say, leads uh, to gravitational collapse and the formation of a black hole. That's, that's suggested by this theorem. And um, this, uh, this theorem uh, leads into the notion of topological censorship, which, I'll, uh, which we'll be talking about uh, in our last lecture uh, tomorrow. Um, here's just a, a hint at the proof, but I'm not going to talk about it. But you can take a look at it if you like. Simply connected means that uh, every, every loop in the space can be deformed to a point. Um, like R3, or like 
S3, three sphere, something like that. Um, so now, we formally begin part two on topology and, and general relativity. And in this first section of part two, we're going to be talking about the topology of black holes. And I need to start by uh, telling a story uh, to help motivate this issue of the topology of black holes. And uh, certainly one of the most remarkable predictions of general relativity uh, is the existence of black holes. Now here's, here's a cartoon uh, sort of depicting the process of gravitational collapse and formation to a black hole. So time is sort of up here. And here's some stellar object. And after it exhausts its nuclear fuel under appropriate conditions, it begins to collapse under its own weight. And as it begins to collapse, the gravitational field intensifies. And the null cones, so to speak, begin turning inward. Uh, and a black hole region forms. So this shaded area is the black hole region. <clears throat> And nothing can escape from that black hole region. There's no signal can be sent out to infinity from any point inside the black hole region. The boundary of the black hole region is the event horizon. And that boundary, the event horizon, is, is the boundary between uh, points that are able to send signals to infinity and points that are not able to send signals to infinity. And uh, notice that the null cones, the null cones are, are tangent to that boundary. The event horizon is a null hypersurface. Okay. Now, uh, the two most famous uh, black hole space times are the Schwarzschild solution and the Kerr solution. And here's the so Schwarzschild solution discovered by Schwarzschild in 1916, shortly after Einstein published his field equations. And uh, it's a static, that is, it's, it's time independent and uh, non-rotating. And it's spherically symmetric, vacuum solution of the Einstein equations. And here's the Einstein metric. This has appeared, of course, in, in other lectures this week, uh, uh, especially the, at least the spatial part. And uh, there's one parameter here, the mass parameter. That's the mass of the black hole. And it met, the metric represents the region, say, outside of a collapsing spherically symmetric star. Now, this diagram down here is a so-called so -called Penrose diagram. And uh, this is a space-time diagram. And you get, it from the R, you get it from the RT plane by making certain transformations. So there's been a coordinate transformation that has straightened out the null cones. So the null cones are at 45 degrees. And there's been a conformal transformation that's, that has brought infinity into a, a finite distance in this picture. Um, the black hole region uh, is the region R less than 2m. And the event horizon here is at R equals 2m. And we live out here uh, R greater than 2m. So uh, this is a two-dimensional picture. We've suppressed these, these round two spheres of radius R. So, uh, it's perhaps helpful to think that each point in this Penrose diagram represents a, a round two sphere. Uh, here we see an observer uh, crossing the event horizon and getting crushed at the R equals zero Schwarzschild singularity. Now, the Kerr solution uh, uh, is a rotating version of the, of the uh, Schwarzschild solution. It was discovered by Kerr many years later. Here's the metric. It's much more complicated. You can understand why it took so long to discover. So this is a stationary. It's time independent, but rotating uh, black hole space time. Uh, it's uh, axisymmetric. It has an axis of rotation. And again, it's a vacuum solution to the Einstein equations. Uh, it contains two parameters now, the mass parameter m and the angular uh, momentum parameter a. Uh, and when A vanishes, this metric does reduce to the Schwarzschild solution. Okay. Now, it's a widely held belief that true astrophysical black holes out there uh, settle down to a Kerr solution. And this uh, belief is based largely on results, the so-called no-hair theorems, that establish the uniqueness of the Kerr solution among all asymptotically flat, asymptotically Minkowskian, stationary, steady state, 
solutions to the vacuum Einstein equations. Um, so the picture is that the ultimate, the ultimate end of gravitational collapse uh, in the steady state limit is a Kerr black hole. And the remarkable detection uh, of LIGO reported last year, well, the picture there is completely consistent with the end state of gravitational collapse being a Kerr black hole. Uh, now, a basic step in the proof of the uniqueness, the... Could you say something more about this interesting comment? Uh, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> that, that seems uh, like a very inspiring sentence, but I, I, can, I cannot justify it myself. About uh, LIGO? Uh, LIGO? LIGO? I take it back. Okay. okay. <laughs> this is a, this is a theoretical, theoretical discussion of black holes. <laughs> And I'm interested, uh, theoretically, in, in the, the, the proof of the no here, here theorem, the black hole uniqueness. And uh, a basic step in the proof uh, of the Kerr solution is Hawking's theorem on the topology of black holes in three plus one dimensions. And, and here's, the state, here's the statement of Hawking's black hole topology theorem. Suppose uh, M is a three plus one conventional dimension. Uh, asymptotically flat, asymptotically Minkowskian, stationary, steady state, black hole space-time obeying the dominant energy condition, need an energy condition. Then cross-sections of the event horizon, cross-sections of the event horizon are topologically two spheres. Okay. Uh, so uh, a, roughly this says that horizon topology, under these natural physical assumptions, horizon topology is spherical. <laughs> And it's a very nice proof. Hawking's proof is variational in nature. It uses the dominant energy condition, which is a curvature condition, together with the Gauss-Binet theorem to show that if this was not a sphere, say it was a surface of genus G greater than or equal to one, torus or two-hole torus, then sigma could be deformed outward to an outer trap surface. We briefly mentioned outer trap surfaces before. We'll define them more formally. In a, in a little bit. Uh, it could be, sigma could, under this genus assumption, sigma could be deformed outward to an outer trap surface. However, there are basic results in the theory of black holes that you can't have outer trap surfaces uh, outside the event horizon. Uh, uh, an outer trap surface outside the event horizon would be visible at infinity, and there are arguments that say that that can't happen. Okay? Therefore, it's got to be a, a sphere, topologically a sphere. Uh, of course, string theory and various related developments like the ADS-C of T correspondence have uh, generated a great deal of interest in gravity in higher dimensions, and in particular in higher dimensional black holes. And so those uh, interested in this situation, uh, one of the first questions uh, to rise to be considered is, uh, does black hole uniqueness hold in higher dimensions? We have the no hair theorems in three plus one dimensions. Uh, in the 80s, Myers and Perry constructed some natural higher dimensional generalizations of the Kerr solution. And these models uh, uh, painted a picture uh, consistent with the situation in three plus one dimensions. Uh, in particular, they, they, these higher dimensional Kerr-like solutions have, have uh, spherical horizon topology. But in, in 2002, Emperon and Real discovered a remarkable example of four plus one dimensional uh, asymptotically Minkowskian stationary vacuum black hole solution uh, uh, space time with horizon topology S2 cross S1. And they dubbed, they dubbed their solution the black ring, S2 cross S1. Uh, this showed in higher dimensions that black hole uniqueness does not hold and uh, horizon topology need not be spherical. <clears throat> this, their, their, their example caused a great surge of activity in the study of higher dimensional black holes. And one of, uh, the main, one of the basic questions that arose is, what horizon topologies are allowed in higher dimensions? Are there any restrictions on horizon topology in higher dimensional black holes? So this is a question that Rick Shane and I addressed a number of years ago that I'd, that I'd like to talk about. And uh, so I want to describe a generalization of Hawking's theorem to higher dimensions. And uh, 
the, the result will be based on properties of marginally outer trap surfaces. So we need to talk about marginally outer trap surfaces. These are, these are very important objects in relativity for a variety of reasons. Um, and we'll be talking about marginally outer trap surfaces contained in, in, in initial data sets. So for us, an initial data set in a space time is a triple VHK, where V is a space-like hypersurface, uh, H is its induced metric, and K is its second fundamental form. Now, if you're, in a, if you're given an initial data set in a space-time obeying the dominant energy condition, then this implies the following inequality, which you've, you've seen in previous lectures, I think even starting with uh, Justin Corvino's lectures, uh, mu greater than or equal to length j along v, where mu is the so-called local energy density. It's obtained by evaluating the Einstein tensor, or if you will, the energy momentum tensor in the direction u. And j is this local momentum density. It's, a, it's this one form on v, or, or its dual is a, a vector. So when we talk about, <coughs> uh, when we're talking about initial data sets in the dominant energy condition, this is, this is the inequality we're talking about. So we want to make, uh, give some definitions. So let VHK be an uh, initial data set in a space time of dimension n greater than or equal to three. And we let sigma be a closed, compact without boundary, two-sided hypersurface in V. Uh, since it's two-sided, it emits a smooth unit normal field within V, call it nu. And we refer to our choice of nu, it's either one thing or the other thing, we refer to that by convention as the outer pointing uh, normal nu. Then along sigma, within the space time, there are two null normal vector fields, L plus and L minus. L plus is U plus nu, where U is the future directed unit normal, and L minus is U minus nu. So we refer to L plus as a, a future directed outward null normal, and L minus as a future directed inward norm, null normal. Then, uh, as in our discussion of Penrose singularity theorem, uh, we can introduce these null sec second fundamental forms, chi plus and chi minus, uh, defined uh, in terms of these covariant derivative of uh, L plus and L minus. Uh, so they, they measure how L plus and L minus uh, vary along sigma. And then you can, you can trace these, you can trace these uh, to get the null expansion scalars. Again, just as in... Uh, our discussion of, of Penrose, although now we're looking at uh, our uh, sigmas lying in a space-like hypersurface V. So theta plus minus, we trace the null second fundamental forms with respect to the induced metric on sigma. And what this gives us really is the divergence of L plus and L minus along sigma. Okay. Uh, so theta plus, again, is, is measuring the divergence of the outgoing light rays from sigma and theta minus is measuring the divergence of the ingoing light rays from sigma. Uh, you can express these null expansion scalars in terms of the initial data. Theta plus minus is the partial trace of the second fundamental form, partial trace along sigma, plus or minus h, where here h is the mean curvature of sigma within V. Uh, in particular, in the so-called time symmetric case, where k vanishes, v is totally geodesic, uh, uh, theta plus is just the mean curvature, mean curvature of sigma within v. Then, as our discussions from yesterday, if both theta plus and theta minus are negative, sigma is a trap surface, but now we're going to be focusing, focusing attention just on the outward null normal only. So, if theta plus is negative, we say that sigma is outer trapped, and if theta plus vanishes along sigma, we say that sigma is a marginally outer trap surface, uh, or MOTS for short. So, um, Again, in, notice that in the time symmetric case, uh, a MOTS, uh, where K vanishes, a MOTS is simply a minimal surface. So in this sense, and in various properties that have been uh, uh, obtained about marginally outer trap surfaces, they are somehow a natural space-time analog of minimal surfaces in Riemannian geometry. Well, let's consider some examples of MOTS for a moment. So we go back to the Schwarzschild space-time, 
and we're looking at this t equals zero slice all the way up to the uh, uh, event horizon. And this, this t equals zero slice uh, uh, is an asymptotically flat space-like hypersurface with boundary, and the boundary is a mod. In fact, this t equals zero slice is totally geodesic. You have k equals zero, so that, that MOTS is actually a minimal surface. Uh, and you perhaps have seen these pictures already. So this is a picture of the t equals zero slice uh, as it uh, would look embedded into Euclidean space. Uh, asymptotically flat, having MOTS, in fact, minimal boundary. Uh, but there are lots, in fact, there are lots of MOTS, marginally outer trapped surfaces, in the short shield solution. Here's another asymptotically flat uh, space-like hypersurface. Um, let's just, for the moment, just think of it as being spherically symmetric, asymptotically flat. Then remember, any point here corresponds to a two-sphere, and any point in this black hole region is a trapped, is a trapped surface, trapped two-sphere. And it was, this was uh, Penrose's magnificent observation uh, to motivate his, his, his theorem about space-times in which trap surfaces occur. But where, where the space-like hypersurface crosses the event horizon at r equals 2m, that's a marginally outer trap surface. Okay? And in general, it won't be a minimal surface. It won't be a minimal surface. And uh, uh, moreover, uh, even if this were not a spherically symmetric uh, space-like hypersurface, any space-like hypersurface of this that you know, asymptotes is asymptotically flat, that crosses the event horizon, that cross-section is a MOTS. Uh, so in fact, in general, in stationary black hole spacetimes, cross-sections of the event horizon are marginally outer trap surfaces. And by cross-section, what I mean is, say, the smooth, uh, compact intersection of uh, the event horizon with a space-like hypersurface. Um, Event horizons are no, are no hypersurfaces. And by Hawking's area theorem, we talked about a version of that a while ago, the uh, null hypersurfaces are a rule generated by null geodesics. And uh, they, the null geodesics have, non -negative, in general, non-negative expansion towards the future. But in the st steady state stationary limit, uh, that null expansion is zero. And so uh, uh, cross-sections of the event horizon which in fact uh, uh, are orthogonal by, the, by null geometry, orthogonal to the null geodesic generators, must have theta plus equals zero. So cross sections uh, uh, of the event horizon in, in stationary steady state black hole space times are MOTS. Typically in dynamical bl black hole space times, which haven't settled down yet to a stationary uh, space, uh, black hole space time, MOTS, MOTS uh, occur. Uh, inside, inside, uh, just inside the event horizon. Now, we need one more piece of information before we can finally state a theorem generalizing black hole, uh, Hawking's black hole topology theorem. Uh, uh, Mott's uh, admit uh, this important notion of stability. And this was introduced by Anderson, Mars, and Simone. So I want to describe what it means for Mott's to be stable. There's some rough, rough connection to stability of minimal surface in, in the Ramanian case, but we'll get to that. But uh, here, stability has to do with variations in the null expansion. So let sigma be a MOTS in an initial data set VHK with outward normal nu. And we consider normal variations of sigma. One parameter family of surfaces sigma t. Uh, with sigma zero being sigma. Variations with variation vector field phi times nu. That is, we're varying sigma with an initial velocity phi times nu, where phi is any smooth function. Phi is any smooth function along, along, um, along sigma. So we have this one parameter family of surfaces. I've sort of dropped the plus signs near, plus for out, outward. Uh, so here's the outward normal, null normal uh, L to sigma. And then we let L of t be the outward null normal of sigma of t. Here, nu of t is the outward null normal to sigma of t. So in this one parameter family of surfaces that we, this, that we varied sigma from, 
uh, we have this function theta of t, which is the null expansion of sigma t. And then you can compute the derivative. Yeah, I know. It's a <laughs> then you can compute the derivative of theta of t with respect to t. And so computation shows, here's d theta dt evaluated at t equals zero, so evaluated at sigma. It's equal, well, it's equal to L of phi, where L um, is, a, is this uh, second order elliptic operator on sigma. So all of these, all of these uh, differential objects uh, are objects like the Laplacian and gradient here are objects on sigma. So this is a second order linear operator and it determines the rate of change of theta with respect to t at t equals zero. Uh, there are several quantities here. Q is a scalar quantity. Yeah, here's what it's equal to. Here it's S sub sigma is the scalar curvature of sigma. Uh, this is an energy momentum term, and this is the null second fundamental form of sigma with respect to that outward null normal L. These two terms have a sign, and that's very important. Now, in the time symmetric case, Second fundamental form vanishes. The, oh, and I didn't mention. So x, x is a vector field. X is a vector field on sigma. It doesn't really matter what it is. It's defined. It's expressed or defined. In, it's expressed in terms of the second fundamental form uh, of the surface uh, of, of, of our space-like hypersurface. Now, in the time symmetric case, uh, theta becomes the mean curvature. Uh, this vector field x vanishes. And this operator L reduces to the classical stability operator, or Jacobi operator, of minimal surface theory. So an analogy with a minimal surface case, we refer to L as the Mott stability operator. However, uh, one has to point out that L is not, in general, a self-adjoint uh, second-order operator because of this, in general, this first-order this first term. Nevertheless, one has the following, as shown by Anderson, Mars, and Simone. Uh, 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 among eigenvalues with, so, so since it's not self-adjoint, it can have complex eigenvalues, but among eigenvalues with smallest real part, there is a real eigenvalue, which is called the principal eigenvalue. And associated uh, to this principal eigenvalue, uh, we have an eigenfunction phi, L of phi equals lambda one of phi, which is unique up to a multiplicative constant and, and can be chosen to be strictly positive. So, in this sense, the Mott stability operator has a simple eigenvalue, lambda 1, lambda 1 of L. And then we, we say that a Mott sigma is stable provided that principal eigenvalue is non-negative. Uh, what's this saying? It says something physical. Uh, it's equivalent to the following. Uh, sigma is stable if and only if there was an outward variation of sigma for which d theta dt at t equals zero is non-negative. This is sort of saying that sigma is stable if and only if uh, it's infinitesimally outermost, something like that. Um, uh, in the minimal surface case where the Mott stability operator reduces to the stability operator of minimal surfaces, uh, this, this uh, assumption on the eigenvalue is really equivalent to the second variation of area being non-negative, which is the standard definition for stability of minimal surfaces. So anyway, this is, uh, this is the definition of stability. And there, uh, it's nice for physical applications to have uh, criteria that guarantees that a MOTS is stable. And there is, in fact, a very basic criterion for a MOTS to be stable. We say that a MOTS sigma is outermost, provided there are no outer trapped or marginally outer trapped surfaces outside of sigma. You only need to consider the ones that are homologous to sigma. If you don't know what homologous means, uh, it doesn't matter. So basically, uh, we say that a MOTS is outermost if there's no uh, outer trap or marginally outer trap uh, surfaces outside of, outside of it. Um, uh, and then it's a basic fact that outer, it's a simple fact, actually, although I haven't given the argument here, that outermost MOTS are stable. Uh, if an outer, if, if sigma was not stable, then we could actually deform it outward, taking as our phi, our speed, to be a positive eigenvalue, uh, eigenfunction associated to the principal eigenvalue. That would actually, in fact, produce an outer trap surface. 
so this is a basic fact that outermost moths are stable. Um, and it's a fact that cross sections of the event horizon, cross sections of the event horizon in asymptotically Minkowskian stationary black hole space times, you need an energy condition, say obeying the null energy condition, are outermost. So here's our, here's our cross section uh, obtained by intersecting with respect to this space like hypersurface. That sigma is outermost in that space like hypersurface. That's because, as we mentioned before, uh, you, can't, uh, you can't have outer trap surfaces or even marginally outer trap surfaces outside the event horizon. So, for that reason, um, uh, cross sections. We've already mentioned that in the stationary case, the cross sections are, are, um, are MOTs, but in fact, uh, more can be said when you have an energy condition, uh, they must be outermost MOTs. Okay. More generally, outermost MOTs can arise as the boundary of the so called trapped re region. This is a, an old heuristic idea from the physics community, which in recent years has been made precise by Anderson and Metzger in low dimensions and by Eichmeier in higher dimensions. So, okay, so now we're finally at a point that where we can state this, uh, this generalization of Hawking's black hole topology theorem. Um, it says the following. Let VHK be an n-dimensional initial data set, n greater than or equal to 3, satisfying the dominant energy condition. Then as sigma is a stable Motsen V, in particular if it's an outermost Motsen V, uh, then, apart from certain exceptional circumstances, sigma must be of positive Umabi type, by which I mean here uh, that sigma must admit a metric of positive scalar curvature. Okay. So let me make a few comments here. First of all, um, this theorem can be, viewed, can be seen as a space-time analog of the fundamental result of Shane and Yao concerning stable minimal hypersurfaces in manifolds of positive scalar curvature. And these kind of ideas have probably already come up in, in Rick's, some of Rick's lectures. Um, now, what are the exceptional circumstances? This conclusion that uh, sigma emits a metric of positive scalar curvature can only fail under very special circumstances. For example, if the dominant energy condition holds strictly at some point, or sigma is not Ricci flat, um, then the exceptional circumstances can be ruled out. Um, so we're saying that sigma admits a metric of positive scalar curvature. That doesn't mean that its induced metric has positive scalar curvature. What this is saying is that that induced metric can be deformed to a metric that has positive scalar curvature. And so what's the point of that? Well, the point is uh, sigma being a positive Imabi type, admitting a metric of positive scalar curvature, curvature implies many well-known restrictions on the topology. And there's a vast literature on this. I, I refer to a particular article here where uh, uh, various uh, uh, obstructions to positive scalar curvature metrics are, are, are discussed. But let me here just consider two basic examples and, and uh, just for simplicity, avoid certain technicalities, we assume that sigma is orientable. Um, okay. Let's consider the conventional case. Uh, where space, the conventional dimension case, where space-time has dimension 3 plus 1, then sigma has two dimensions. And if sigma admits a metric of positive scalar curvature, since it's two dimensions, that means it admits a metric of positive Gaussian curvature. And so then, by Gauss-Binet theorem, sigma's got to be a two-sphere, and we recover Hawking's, we recover Hawking's theorem. But let's, let's bump things up a bit. Let's go to space-time dimension 4 plus 1, where sigma is three-dimensional, uh, then we have the following classical result of Gromov, Lawson, and Shane Yao. It says the following. If sigma is a closed, orientable three-manifold of positive Umabi type, emitting a metric of positive scalar curvature, then sigma must be diffeomorphic to one of the, follow one of the following. A spherical space, by which I mean the three-sphere or a quotient of the three-sphere. Now, I guess 10 years ago or 15 years ago, we'd have to say a homotopy three-sphere, three but now we have the positive resolution of the Poincaré conjecture. So a spherical space is 
a, either a three-sphere, topologically a three-sphere, or a quotient of a three-sphere, like, like projective three-space or a lens space, lens space, something like that. So it's got to be either a spherical space or an S2 cross S1 or a connected sum of the above two types. Um, just a side comment, this, this result can be understood as possible uh, by the prime decomposition theorem. You can write any uh, closed orientable three manifold as a connected sum of spherical spaces, S2 cross S1s, and so-called k pi 1 spaces. Now, k pi 1 spaces are space, spaces like the torus whose universal cover is, uh, is contractible. Um, but if sigma uh, admits a metric of positive scalar curvature, there can't be any k pi 1s. That's, that's the main message of this theorem. So you're left with a connected a spherical space, or S2 cross S1, or a connected sum of the above two types. So anyway, the way I read this theorem is that the basic horizon topologies, in the case that uh, dim dimension of sigma is 3, are the three-sphere, which is realized, say, by the myers perry black holes, or S2 cross S1, which is realized by the Emperor and Real black ring. Okay. Uh, so these are the possible topologies. Um, if you would assume certain uh, symmetry assumptions, you can actually reduce this list. And this has been some nice work of some other people. Um, these are the possible topologies. The question is, which of these topologies can actually be realized by, by black hole spacetimes? And a few years ago, Kandari and Lucietti constructed a charged supersymmetric black hole spacetime with RP3 horizon topology. Uh, more recently, Curry, Weinstein, and, and Yamada uh, have, have a construction to produce vacuum black hole spacetimes with uh, certain uh, lens space topologies. Gilbert, this is coming out soon? OK. <laughs> so it's an interesting problem to now see what, what and physicists are interested in, in sort of a full classification, say, in, in the case of higher dimensional black holes, which ones can be realized. So let me, make, let me make some comments on the proof. Um, so we had the Mott stability operator. If you just formally set that vector field x uh, to 0 in the Mott stability operator, you, would you obtain this simpler symmetrized or self-adjoint operator L naught of phi. There's no first order term. L naught of phi is minus Laplacian phi plus Q times phi. Okay. Um, then the key fact in the proof, I mean, uh, this is where all the action is. And I'm, I'm not presenting the proof of this, but I, uh, you can uh, consult these references. One is the original paper uh, with Rick. The argument in our paper shows the following, that the principal eigenvalue of this simplified symmetrized operator is greater than or equal to the eigenvalue, principal eigenvalue of the Mott stability operator. So in our theorem, we're assuming, uh, we're trying to produce, we're assuming that sigma is uh, a stable Mott's. We're trying to produce a metric of positive scalar curvature on it. Uh, since we're assuming it's a stable Mott's, this principal eigenvalue uh, uh, of the Mott stability operator is non-negative, and this implies that the principal eigenvalue of this simplified symmetrized operator uh, is non-negative. What's happened here uh, morally is that we've reduced to the situation to morally the uh, Riemannian, time symmetric or Riemannian case where very well-known methods uh, 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 are known to apply. And in fact, what we do, we take our metric gamma and we make a conformal change, gamma tilde. It's equal to this uh, phi to this power, where phi is a positive eigenfunction corresponding to uh, now the uh, principal eigenvalue of this uh, L naught, the simplified operator. So phi satisfies this equation. Then, then, you, make a standard, then you make a standard computation uh, there's standard formulas that relate the scalar curvature 
of a metric and a conformally related metric. You just apply that and you get this expression. And then you make use of this equation, you plug in, and lo and behold, what you get is this expression. And all of these terms, all of these terms are non-negative. Okay? And then you can further show by further perturbations that, uh, in fact, uh, you, sigma will carry a metric of strictly positive scalar curvature everywhere unless a bunch of stuff, unless a bunch of stuff uh, vanishes. Uh, those are the exceptional circumstances. So this is the, this is the idea of the proof, and uh, th this is sort of the, the key factor. Um, one, drawback, one drawback of this theorem is that uh, it allows certain possibilities that we'd like to rule out. There were there are certain situations that physicists, physicists working on these higher dimensional black holes want to know whether they're there or if they're ruled out. For example, the theorem doesn't rule out the possibility of a, of a vacuum black hole spacetime with toroidal horizon depart, toroidal, say flat toroidal horizon topology. Um, so in su subsequent work, we were able to, to rule out uh, such possibilities. Um, so here's a theorem up here. Uh, it's, it's a rigidity result. And it says the following, let VHK be an n-dimensional and greater or equal to three initial data set in space-time, obeying the dominant energy condition. And suppose sigma is weakly outermost in V. That is, suppose there exists, uh, there are no, suppose there are no outer trapped surfaces. Suppose there are no outer trapped surfaces outside of and homologous to sigma. Then if sigma is not of positive Yamabe type, then there's, in fact, an outer neighborhood of sigma uh, foliated by moths. But if sigma's outermost, you can't have outer trapped or marginally outer trapped surfaces outside by definition. So if sigma's outermost, then sigma must be a positive Yamabe type without exception. So uh, stability is not enough for this re result uh, to rule out these, these borderline cases. Sigma's got to be outermost, which is, in general, a stronger condition. Uh, well, we end a little early today. Uh, uh, thank you very much. <laughs>